ever since news broke out of the withdrawal of a small contingent of Qatari troops. There has been a lot of hysteria and reports of tensions rising between Eritrea and Djibouti. For those who are wondering what a Djibouti is, don't worry, you're not alone. It's a perfectly normal question to ask. When you were told you were being deployed to Djibouti, had you, had you heard of the place? I mean, never heard of Djibouti ever. Um, actually, I had to go to the map and find where it was. And when I told family and friends that I was being deployed to Djibouti, they, they have actually said, you're kidding me, Djibouti? <laughs> you know, and I, I was like, I was taken back. I was like, it, it, it became the running joke. He's going right. to Djibouti. <laughs> Hilarious. Djibouti is located in the Horn of Africa, bordering Somalia, Ethiopia, and Eritrea and is a military hub to a string of foreign militaries, with the Chinese being the latest to establish a military base in the country. In 2008, Eritrea was forced to take swift appropriate measures when it came under an unprovoked attack from Djibouti. Although that's not how the media, in particular the French government-owned media, France 24, described the short-lived incident at the time. In mid-April 2008, Eritrea invaded the Rastumeira territory. As always, Eritrea is made out to look like the villain, when that couldn't be further from the truth. Eritrea simply responded to an unprovoked attack, meant to drag it into a dispute, a dispute designed by Djibouti's foreign masters. Rastumeira territory, a small piece of arid land and an islet strategically located at the entrance to the Red Sea. Despite backup by the French army, Djibouti was forced to draw back while its enemy enforced their positions with trenches. France is the former colonial power that ruled the territory of what's now called Djibouti. The French still maintains a military base in the country and has an agreement to assist Djibouti in an event of an attack. Hence why the involvement of the French army. Only in this case Djibouti wasn't attacked, but rather was the one who attacked Eritrean units inside Eritrea. And Eritrea has every right to defend its territory and take necessary measures and use reasonable force to deter any further attacks. No foreign military power located in Djibouti, whether that be the French or others, can intimidate or stop Eritrea from defending its territory. Now, there are a lot of unanswered questions to some of you watching this video, like, why was Djibouti willing to be used as a tool, as cannon fodder for others? Who are the foreigners that designed this dispute, and for what purpose? Why was the brief incident, blown out of proportion, and made out to look like, as if it was a full large-scale war, with thousands of casualties? These and many more questions can be raised. To answer some of these questions, and put things into context, and give viewers a perspective of what's going on, let's first start with a confidential cable leaked by WikiLeaks. In a meeting between former U.S. Ambassador to Ethiopia, Donald Yamamoto, and Deputy Foreign Minister Tekadu Alemu, comes a damning revelation on how Ethiopia worked hard to break up the brotherly relations between Eritrea and Djibouti. The government of Djibouti's opposition to Agad actions in Somalia are the result of its fear of Eritrean President Isaias, Tikda said, as well as President Gilles' personal business interests with Eritrea. When he says opposition to actions in Somalia, He's referring to the invasion of Somalia in 2006, where hundreds of thousands of Somalis were displaced from their homes, and thousands more dead, as a result of the US-backed Ethiopian invasion of Somalia. Channel 4 News has obtained an exclusive document revealing America's role in the planning and execution of last month's Ethiopian invasion of Somalia. It reveals the US having to do close business with a government whose human rights record has so recently been condemned. As John Snow discovered, it's a document no one was very keen to discuss at the African Union summit in Addis Ababa today. You did this with Ethiopia, but also the Americans have been very much. Well, so, this, somehow they helped us. <laughs> How did they help you? <laughs> this is enough. <laughs> the United States know, They gave them the green light. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Tikta claims that the Djiboutian government was in fear of the Eritrean president. What we see here, from the deputy foreign minister of Ethiopia, is the usual disinformation and lies, which is the norm and culture, of the TPLF regime in Ethiopia. 
Why would the Djibouti government be scared of the Eritrean president? And what personal business does the Djiboutian president have in Eritrea? None. The fact of the matter is, while this meeting between the Ethiopian deputy foreign minister and the U.S. ambassador was taking place, a multi-million dollar hotel, belonging to the Djiboutian president Gile, was being constructed in Diridawa, Ethiopia, not Eritrea. More on this, and the Djibouti president in a bit. The confidential cable then goes on to reveal how the deputy Ethiopian foreign minister, Tekeda, maintained that the government of Djibouti was on the wrong path and added that Djibouti was not strong enough to take Ethiopia's continued friendship and forbearance for granted. Tekada urged that the United States government speak frankly with Djibouti about its role in the region. He said that President Gala would pay attention to U.S. concerns, given the importance to him of the U.S. military base in Djibouti. He must be told to choose whose side he wanted to take. That sounds awfully familiar. Where have we heard this type of ultimatum before? Either you're with us, either you love freedom and with nations which embrace freedom, or you're with the enemy. There's no in-between. You're either with us or you're with the enemy. That's, that's clear. I will continue to make that clear. Obviously someone's been watching too many of George W. Bush's speeches, and perhaps found the opportunity to milk and put them into use. Anyway, you can clearly see who pushed Djibouti and its president to take the wrong path. President Gilly was born and raised in Diadoua, Ethiopia, and ended up building a hotel there, as mentioned earlier on, which cost tens of millions of Ethiopian beer. However, sources on the ground say that, he might have sold the hotel a few years ago. The Djibouti president, also has a luxury home in the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa. Ethiopia is practically his home. It's his birthplace, it's where he grew up, it's where he has a house, and other businesses. So it's not surprising to see why Djibouti was so willing to be a poodle of the Ethiopian regime, and too weak to have its own independent policy, or as the deputy Ethiopian foreign minister put it, Djibouti was not strong enough to take Ethiopia's continued friendship and forbearance for granted. In a 2009 leaked confidential cable, former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Susan Rice, asked the then Ethiopian Prime Minister Meli Zenoui, on a potential stand-alone sanctions regime on Eritrea, based on the false pretext, based on a lie. She proposed a sanctions regime, under which Eritreans can be designated for threatening the peace and stability in Somalia, and violating Djibouti's border. To the delight of the Ethiopian Prime Minister, who had declared war on Eritrea in 1998, he strongly backed the United States' approach, with glee. Just three months after the secret meeting between Susan Rice and Meli Zenoui, in which they conspired to impose sanction on Eritrea, Resolution 1907 was adopted, in December 2009, imposing sanctions on Eritrea. Falsely accusing Eritrea of supporting armed groups in Somalia, despite failing to bring forth a single shred of real evidence. To this date, over the past couple of years, year after year, the Somalia Eritrea Monitoring Group has said it has found no evidence whatsoever of Eritrean support to Al-Shabaab. None. The Djibouti incident was also used as a pretext for the sanctions, as intended. So just to recap, Ethiopia invades and destabilizes Somalia, with the support and backing of the United States, and then Eritrea is not only used as a scapegoat, but also punished with sanctions based on lies for the mess they created. Djibouti is made to provoke Eritrea, in order to get a reaction, and then Eritrea is punished with sanctions, for defending herself. An incident that took place within a matter of hours, within 48 hours, is blown all out of proportion, and then later used as an added pretext for placing sanctions on Eritrea. While a real war between Eritrea and Ethiopia, that spanned for years, between 1998 and 2000, which cost the lives of tens of thousands of people, hasn't warranted any sanctions on Ethiopia, who has been violating international law, who has failed to abide by the Eritrea-Ethiopia Boundary Commission's ruling, and continues to occupy sovereign Eritrean territories for more than 15 years. 15 years of illegal occupation of Eritrean territories by Ethiopia, and no sanctions. A less than 48 hours incident, where Eritrea is forced to swiftly neutralize an unprovoked attack is used as an added pretext for sanctions to be placed on Eritrea. 
This is the corrupt world we're living in. Where individuals, can simply make up a lie, and then have an entire nation and its people punished, based on that lie. It just shows how corrupt, the United Nations Security Council is, where serious decisions, that not only affect a given nation, but also affect the peace and stability of an entire region, are decided by a handful of people. In 2010, Eritrea and Djibouti, agreed to the mediation by Qatar, in which Qatari troops were deployed as part of the mediation effort. In June 2017, Qatar informed the government of Djibouti, that it has withdrawn all its troops deployed on the borderline, in the Djiboutian territory, reports the Qatari Ministry of Foreign Affairs website. It's quite an odd statement, but this is coming on the backdrop of the severing of relations, between several countries and Qatar, over accusations of Qatar's support for terrorism. Djibouti, is one of the nations that downgraded its relations, with Qatar. Just days later, Djibouti falsely accuses Eritrea of occupying the so-called, disputed territory. The Djiboutian foreign minister also said that his military was, quote-unquote, on high alert. It's funny watching a country, who has no real combat experience, who doesn't know the meaning of war, coming up with empty rhetorics, and bravados, talking greasy, to a country that went through a 30-year-long armed struggle, defeating not only a well-equipped Ethiopia, but also its superpower backers. It's like a person, who has never had a professional boxing match in his life, talking crap, to the boxing champion in the world, barking on how he's going to knock him out. The outcome is inevitable. Not only did the guy with no professional boxing experience, that was barking a lot on how he was going to knock out the best, get TKO'd and defeated, but also got the snot knocked out of him. It's the same with Djibouti. They're trying to feed off Eritrea's military background and history. It doesn't matter if they get the snot knocked out of them like McGregor, and like they did in that brief incident in 2008. They just want to be seen of being in a manufactured conflict, with one of the most warfare-experienced, disciplined militaries on the continent. The main objectives of the lie though, is the same as always, for PR, and other political motives, to present Eritrea as the villain, as the aggressor, to perpetuate the illegal sanctions, and so on. Djibouti is merely a mouthpiece, of those that designed this manufactured conflict, it's used to bark out false accusations, and lies. And just like most lies, that are told about Eritrea, this lie by the foreign minister of Djibouti, only had a short lifespan. In June 24, 2017, an African intelligence website reported that, the French military, sent a Mirage fighter aircraft over the zone, but detected no troop movements whatsoever. None. It was also reported, how Ethiopia, who became a non-permanent member of the Security Council, for the years 2017 and 2018, pushed for the manufactured tensions, to be placed on the agenda of a Security Council meeting. And guess who's representing Ethiopia, at the Security Council, who pushed for the manufactured tensions to be placed on the agenda? It's none other than, the former Ethiopian Deputy Foreign Minister, Teka De Lamu, who basically in short, admitted that, Djibouti was too weak to, disobey Ethiopia. Let's go, 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 let's go